Well, good morning and welcome to Moraga Valley Presbyterian Church. We're so glad to have you joining us in worship this morning. Listen to just a piece of Psalm 100 as we prepare to worship the Lord. Shout with joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Why don't you stand? Let's sing together. To sing in the valley, to look toward your goodness. And my heart is set, and my heart set on who you are. You're the light that consumes the dark, the joy and the strength to lift up.
came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the
God, that's our prayer this morning. We offer ourselves to you. We ask that you would take our hearts this morning, soften them so that we can hear from you. We can hear from your word and apply it and grow from it. God, thank you so much that we get to, um, some of us out on the patio, we get to be together, we get to gather. And for those at home who are healthy and get to continue to be a part of services this way too, God, we thank you for this. We thank you for technology, Lord God. We thank you more so that we just get to worship because you deserve all of our praise, all the honor, all the glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And if you're out on the patio, you can go ahead and take a seat. Well, amen, and thank you all so much for being here. My name is Tommy Branagh. I'm one of our associate pastors, and we're just thrilled to have you worshiping with us this morning. You know, if you are new or just kind of checking us out for the first handful of times, uh, wherever you are watching online, there's a button that says connect, and we would love for you to click that and just share a little bit of information about who you are so we can tell you more about who we are. And parents, if you're watching online, there's also a button that says kids, and that has content for your kids that we would love for them to be able to engage with and just learn a little bit more about who Jesus is and his plans for their life. Well, we have some really exciting news here. Uh, you may have heard that California regulations have changed and indoor worship is actually now allowed. You can have up to 25% capacity indoors. So here's what that's going to mean for us at MVPC. You know, currently we are doing some upgrades to our technology that are going to allow us to live stream our services so that one day we'll be able to do live worship here in the sanctuary together and also be able to broadcast that online. But we are not quite there yet. So while we are waiting for those upgrades to finish, what we are actually going to do is to invite you to join us uh, when we record our services on Tuesday nights. So starting the first Sunday, well, the first week of March, um, what will be the first Tuesday of March, you are invited to actually join us at 7.15 on Tuesday night to come be in the sanctuary as we worship together and preach. It will be great to have you here. Uh, you'll be able to sign up for that online, kind of the same way that we've managed it for the patio. And then that service is what we will be, uh, as we've kind of been doing, uh, sharing still on the patio and online on Sunday morning. So we are so excited to be able to take this kind of next step forward. Um, and we will eagerly anticipate, you know, the rest of the steps forward. But want to let you know that that's what's coming up. And then also want to let you know that right now we are doing nominations for our church officers. So that would be our elders, our deacons, and our nominating committee. So if there's somebody who you think would just be a great fit for one of those roles, you can go to our website and you'll see something that says officer nomination on there. And you can click that and submit who that person would be because we would love to know uh, who it is that should be serving those roles for us over, these, uh, over the coming year. Well, we have entered into the season of Lent as a church, and we actually have something really special. Uh, this morning, we have John and Bob with us to share a special Lenten message, so you guys can take it away. Thank you. Lent is the time where we Christians prepare our heart and our soul to celebrate Christ's sacrifice. And one of the traditions at MVPC has been our Easter offering, where we support some of our mission partners through that offering. And we thought Global Ministries team and stewardship in collaboration thought it would be a great time in Lent to look back at some of the, time, at some of the ministries that we've been able to support over the years through our Easter offering. So I've asked John to join me. John has led uh, Global Ministries team um, to share some of the mechanics about how Easter offering partners are chosen and to share a memory from our Easter offering past. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah, so... Um it is a special time, and you know, every year, as Bob pointed out, the Global Missions Team, or GMT, prayerfully and carefully selects a couple of partners to receive a special gift, gift at this time. And last year, uh, we had a really cool opportunity to support UPU in Congo, which is why I'm wearing this shirt. Uh, we've supported that ministry for many, many years through Masai Sanguma, but last year, the main building in the university blew off, including all the solar panels on it. Um, so our, our Easter offering helped to go prepare, uh, repair that, which was a really big deal in a country that has, or a region of the country that only has one university and no central source of power so that they could continue studying. And we also got to support a women's, women's scholarship for the university, which in a country that only a tiny percentage of the people get to go to university and a far tinier percentage of that uh, are women, that's actually pioneering work that we all get to be a part of. And just to see how big of a deal it is to graduate from university in Congo, I want you to enjoy this really special clip from last year's university graduation. Awesome. 
That was amazing. I've seen a lot of university graduations, but that was exuberant. It is so neat, to, and I am so grateful that we can be part of a ministry and further God's work, work in the world. And um, it is also really important to mention that we are thankful for the generosity of this congregation who gave in, during COVID and shelter in place during economic turmoil that they were part of this. And John, I gotta tell you, you've been to Congo. It's really neat to hear that mem memory from you as well. Yeah, it's fun to share it. Thanks, Bob. You know, we're, we're gonna prepare our hearts during this Lenten time. It's gonna be exciting to see where God will take us and, and move us forward and who um, the Global Ministries team will uh, uh, pick for us to uh, support in this time and in this coming Easter offering. So thank you very much and we look forward to that. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks all. Well, John and Bob, thank you so much. And church, as we now come into our time of offering where we have the opportunity to sort of do giving uh, to support the regular and ongoing work of this church, we just want to let you know that if you're watching online, there's a button that says give and you can click that and that'll guide you through it. There's also going to be a number on the screen where you can text to give or if you're with us on the patio, uh, there's some boxes where you can kind of place in-person offerings. But right now we're just going to have Tanner leading us in some uh, music and it's going to be time for you to be able to do your giving and also just to prepare your hearts for the word that we're going to get to hear today which is so special from Pastor Dave Ricketts and Pastor Curtis. So uh, let's take this time to prepare ourselves and to offer ourselves. Scripture reading today will be found in the book of Revelation, chapter 7, verse 9 through 17. Atu Taruvata Nenu Chudaga Idigo Prati Janamulo Nundiyu Prati Vamsamulo Nundiyu Prajalalo Nundiyu Aya Bhashalu Matla Duvarilo Nundiyu Vachi Yavadunu Lekimpa Jalani Yoka Goppa Samu Hamukanu Badenu Varu Telani Vastramulu Dharinchukonavare Kajurapu Mok. Mataru cheta patukoni, sim hasanamu yadutanu, gorrepilla yadutanu, niluva badi. De ropera hurt, felsting in fins horse for good, handsome sit the patronan or kus lamet. Atlid englatni stow the crinkum house satid or altuncona or verut nor fjodar, or their fiatlu fram fir a house satinu or ausion lucina, tilpal good. Amen. 찬송과 영광과 지혜와 감사와 존귀와 능력과 힘이 우리 하나님께 길이길이 함께 하시기를 바랍니다. 아멘. 하였습니다. Und einer von den Ältesten hob an und sprach zu mir, wer sind diese, die mit weißen Kleidern angetan sind? Und woher sind sie gekommen? Je lui répondis, Mon Seigneur, tu le sais. Il me dit alors, Ce sont ceux qui viennent de la grande tribulation. Ils ont lavé leur robe, ils l'ont blanché dans le sang de l'agneau. Por isso estão diante do trono de Deus e o servem de dia e de noite no seu templo. E aquele que está sentado sobre o trono os cobrirá com sua sombra. Já não terão hambre, nem sed, nem o sol les hará daño, nem nenhum color abraçará abraçador. E ela ia negar, se mhasa na madhya mundundu gorre pilla variki, Kaperiai, Jiva Jalamula Bugalu Yodaku Varin in an Adipinchunu. They would evari Kandulunundi, Prati Bashpa Bindu Vunu Tudichi Veyunu. 
Well, welcome again this morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm here with one of my good friends, Pastor Curtis Fleming, and this is going to be a little different kind of a sermon. Uh, it's going to be a dialogue between us. Uh, I'll start and kind of get us some background on the text, and then Curtis will take over and kind of take it from there in terms of, all right, how do we apply this passage in our lives? We've been working through this series of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah has been talking about this vision that he has to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And we're going to jump this morning, as you've heard, to Revelation chapter 7, and a different vision, but one that carries much the same in terms of its passion for justice, for community, for building God's people back up that we saw in Nehemiah. So we're looking this morning at Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. And we're going to take a quick break from that one series. This is just kind of a one-off sermon here. Now, this vision that John sees is what heaven is going to be like. And in order to really understand this, we need to take a little step back and look at chapter 6. Now, we, uh, in the fall, did a series on the Revelation and, the, and the, sort of the letters to the seven churches here. And, and this right is right after that. Now, in chapter 6, we see these seven seals, or the six seals, actually, that are broken on this scroll that the Lamb holds. And each uh, seal, as it's broken, uh, has a, like another force that is unleashed on earth. It is destroying this planet, actually. But after, those, after the sixth seal is opened, sort of the physical foundation of creation is rattled and people are running, scattered. They're trying to find a place to hide. And there's a question right at the end of chapter 6 in verse 17 that's an important one for us. For the great day of wrath has come and who can withstand it? The question in another translation is, and who can stand in the midst of this? And when John reaches this point, he then kind of takes a break. He realizes, man, chapter 6 was heavy. That was a lot. Let me, let me give the people just a breath. And then he starts in chapter 7 and, and has this vision of the 144,000, the 12,000 from each tribe of Judah that comes down, or each tribe of Israel that comes down, Judah being one of them. And then we start in chapter 7 in verse 9, where it says, And then I looked and I saw this great multitude that was there. It's this vision of what heaven is going to be like in this heavenly worship service. And the question then is, who can stand? And we get the answer in chapter 7. And who can stand? It's those gathered around the throne of God that have their robes washed white in the blood of the Lamb. Sort of this paradox there but also who have withstood this great tribulation. And so we're going to unpack a little bit about that. What's this vision? What's this worship service that we see there? What does that tell us about heaven and, and this character, this God? And then what do we see in terms of uh, this sort of hope that is offered there, that these people have withstood, they have made it through this great tribulation, and they have withstood it. They can stand, and if they can stand, we can as well. So two main points we're going to look at. Let's look at the first one. Heaven is a Christ-centered, multi-ethnic community. Heaven is a Christ-centered, multi-ethnic community. In this image, we get a glimpse of what the kingdom of God will be like, and it includes men and women from every tribe and every nation and every tongue imaginable, from every time as well. These people are all gathered around the throne and they are all worshiping God. It is an amazing multitude that nobody can count, we're told. And actually, this is a fulfillment of a promise that God made to Abraham all the way back, the very first covenant he made with Abraham. And he takes Abraham outside of his tent. He says, Abraham, look up. Can you count those stars? And here it is from Genesis 12, verse 5. And he took him, Abram, outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. If you did, you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be, Abram. And that was in Genesis. That's the very first book of the Bible. Now here we are at the end of the Bible, and we see a, a picture of that, that vision, that promise that God made come to pass. And here it is, this great multitude that nobody can count. It's impossible. It's, it is just fathomable, this breadth and the wealth of the people that are there. Children of Abraham by faith. Amen. Yes. 
Some, and that 144,000 we saw in verses one through six are definitely children of Abraham, but now he says, what's interesting in there, by the way, sorry, side note between past, he says he, can, he hears them, and now he opens his eyes and he says, and I saw a great multitude from every tribe, not just from the 12, but from every tribe in the entire world. In heaven, everyone's gonna speak their own language still. Isn't that interesting? Now, in that, I think, carries another theme forward from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came down on the, the disciples and the apostles at that point that were there, and they began to speak uh, the, the gospel message to these people that were from all over the region, all kinds of different languages. And this is what it says in Acts chapter 2. In other words, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, this mighty rushing wind, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. And even in heaven, we're going to hear their own languages being spoken. God doesn't conglomerate us all and we all speak one language. Although if you talk to anyone that speaks Spanish, they'll tell you that Spanish is the, the, the language of heaven. And we all better learn it now or we're going to get lost up there. You don't need Babel up there, huh? No. Okay. Right. <laughs> no rose out of stone. No. <laughs> He understands our languages, good. He does understand our languages, yeah. But here in heaven, God, God doesn't wipe every different language out. There's these varieties that is there. And God maintains the, the cultural peace of each person and each tribe and tongue and nation. We're, not, we're still ourselves when we get to heaven. And there's this great diversity that is there. It's, it's this amazing picture of diversity that's there. That's why missions now, we have to be really careful. We don't export our own culture into this other culture. As we go, as we go try to export the gospel, that we don't export our own culture as well because we're not trying to have people be American Christians. We want them to be whatever their country is kind of Christian. We, we don't want to export the bad stuff as well. We just want to export the gospel as we go. I, one of the things became clear to me actually this last summer as, uh, as I was watching sort of what our country was going through and there was a, a growth area that I recognized in myself. And when I was growing up in Santa Cruz, I had friends from all kinds of different cultures. I, I played with kids from five or six different cultures. And, and honestly, I didn't even really notice. It wasn't an issue for me at all. And I used to feel proud that I could say I didn't see color. Color and, and racial ethnic differences didn't really matter to me. I was friends with whoever. But this summer I came to realize that, and I think this passage actually tells us that, that God does see differences, that God does see the, the similarities in us all, but also the, the differences in us all. And, and as Christians and as a pastor, I want to see those differences as well and celebrate those differences, celebrate the cultural, the linguistic differences that, that we each bring. That was part of why, church, we tried to have you read uh, Be the Bridge this fall together. I wanted you to hear from someone else speaking from a different cultural stance, but who was still a Christian, their experience. And, and I didn't want to just have a conversation about race. I wanted you to hear from someone else that experienced some of that, what their own experience was like. And that was exciting for me in some ways. I know it was really challenging for some folks in our church as well, but it was one other piece that was really exciting was actually pulling together all the people that did that, that, um, that Bible reading yeah, video that we got to yeah. see before that with all of these different languages and hearing them all was so fascinating. It's the same passage read in all these different languages. And for me, it was this little glimpse of, I think, what heaven's going to be like. This amazing diversity that we have as people. And I know you, you and I talked about diversity and you talked about this is how God has always been, yeah, right? Yeah, he kind of sets things up that way and if, even in what they consider to be general revelation, right? Mm. The nature, we look at nature, right? There's like 250,000 different species of plants <laughs> and that doesn't even go into zoology and talking about the animal kingdom. You know, not uh, vertical uh, evolution, but right. just God allows for his creation to, to expand in different varieties. I see pictures of dogs, you know, I'm sure everything started with one dog or two dogs, right? <laughs> but you have so many different, you know, species. Uh, but to God, that's beautiful. 
beautiful. I mean, he yeah. loves that. He loves diversity. And, uh, you know, who are we? Uh, this, the, the questing God. Yeah. Um, and one point is that I, I heard is that um, in order for humanity to really understand and see God, um, they, we have to see him in each other because we're his oh. image bearers. Yeah, yeah. And, and he is so expansive that uh, if we are going to see him, I need to see him in the face of each other. Yeah. I need to see him in the face of those who are diverse from me because every facet of diversity is a picture of God. It gives another little it gives glimpse another of another glimpse it. of God. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. You know, in the midst of that incredible diversity, even in the diversity that we see in heaven, there's a unifying factor yes. for them all as well. And mm-hmm. that's Jesus and yeah. his sacrifice that united all of those people. And there's actually another factor as well that unites them. And it's that we're told in scripture, they're, they're the ones that have all withstood through the great mm, tribulation. Right. Which leads me to point two, that this vision of heaven is an empowering vision for those that are in trouble. Whether it's you and me right now, or I mean, during COVID, the struggles we're facing, and I don't know what you're facing at home right now, but it was an empowering vision for the first century church as well. There's a hard truth in this passage for Christians like me, and you and I have talked about it, and that Tribulation and suffering are a normative Christian experience. It's what's supposed to be normal for us, and, but for a lot of us, it's not. And it's, that's hard for me to kind of wrap my head around and wrap my heart around as well. You know, I grew up um, hearing about and being terrified by the tribulation. I don't know if I grew up in a Baptist church. I, did you grow up in oh, a Baptist yeah, church? Baptist background, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. so yeah. I, I remember uh, being a little kid and watching, I don't know if you ever saw this movie, um, the Thief in the Night movie that was made in the yeah, 70s. Left Behind. And yeah, Left Behind night. series, yeah. all of that, that. That the tribulation for so long in so many of our churches has been thought of as this like major event that's gonna happen. But I bet, actually, if you asked John as he was writing this, do you feel like you're going through tribulation right now? He said, yeah. yeah. I'm isolated on this little island. I can't preach to my people anymore. I'm all alone. I've got, I've got these churches that I'm supposed to be responsible for, and I, all I can do is write letters to them and hope they get it. Yeah. And then don't forget, Nero had just left the <laughs> yeah. scene. I mean, you yeah. Know. Talk about persecution. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, and real, I think this idea of tribulation and trouble is something that, that's normative. I mean, if you look back at Revelation, and again, this is one of the passages that we looked at church to the letter to Smyrna in Revelation 2, 9 and 10. It says, it's this, I know your afflictions or tribulations and your poverty. Don't be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will have to suffer persecution or tribulation for 10 days. Now the NIV uses two different words there. One is afflictions and one is persecution. It's the same Greek word though and it's the same word for tribulation. These are tribulations that these churches are going through, which says this is normal. This is, this is the tribulation that these people were experiencing and they then get this vision of, here's the people that have made it through that. Now, as we heard from some of these churches or, uh, as we were studying, you know, they, they were being persecuted because they, they couldn't uh, bow down to the, to the emperor and they were being cut out of society and were being not only just persecuted but killed for their faith and all kinds of stuff. Economic boycott. Economic boycott, all kinds of stuff that was going on for them. But if they can make it through that, if they can withstand and stand up underneath that pressure, here's a reward that is coming for them. And that, that sense of reward has always been an important part of sort of this image of heaven that we as Christians have. There's a reward waiting for those that withstand these tribulations and troubles. The promise of verses 16 and 17 actually come from a a quote from Isaiah 49.10. This whole section right here is is a big quote from Isaiah 49. And its original context, this passage from Isaiah promised the exiles that were coming back, they would be protected by God and God would prepare them to return to the promised land. But now John's vision expands and he takes what the exile Christians or Israelites felt and moves it to all Christians. And this is what all of us are going to experience from God. The sense that neither hunger or, you know, we want hunger or thirst for anything, which meant like whatever your deepest needs are, God knows them and God's going to meet those for you. You don't have to, you don't have to worry. You don't have to struggle. God knows what you need and he's going to meet those needs for you. The greatest happiness 
He's going to provide. Now, the believers that lived in the Middle Ages had to deal with all kinds of persecution and suffering as well. They had unclean water, disease that killed so many so quickly, or slaves living in, in the American South that took this vision of heaven of God is going to catch us and God's going to hold us fast, that he's got the whole world in his hands. He sees me. He knows what's, what I'm going through. But it's not actually our sort of normal experience to experience that suffering on a regular basis. Most of us live these really comfortable lives. And I, I sometimes, I don't know what to do with that. You and I had a brief conversation about that. And I really appreciated your sort of take on that in terms of um, like to whom much is given, much is required. And, and just because we're blessed doesn't mean we're off the hook. So right. To speak. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, there's a term. Noblesse oblige, which means obligations of the noble, those who have privilege uh, in this life. Um, that privilege is given uh, to us uh, by God to be used to uh, bring justice mitzvot, right? And with the Hebrew word, in, you know, in which is justice or just mm. restorative justice, yeah. that we use our privilege, we use our position to glorify God by helping our neighbor. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the thing about uh, those of us who are blessed because there's others who are, aren't privileged, you know, and, um, and when we do that, we, we honor God. Yeah. Uh, and so we're not um, uh, exempt uh, because we are isolated a little bit or we have a little bit more, but it goes to that parable of those who have God have given talents, right? Yeah. And, you know, he expects a return for the <laughs> giftedness that he gives you. And what he yeah. hates is when you take your talent and you just go bury it, right? You know what I mean? You can't, he doesn't want us to do that. I mean, we're required to still be his representatives, his, his hand and his feet here on earth. Yeah. So if we don't get a pass because we live in a particular uh, part of the world in a particular time where we're, we're blessed probably more so than our parents and our grandparents. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure when they when yours came over from Europe and oh, yeah. and mine's from the south, they you know, they were, they, they were right? struggling. It was hard. You know, it, was, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. I thank you. I, I I really appreciate that perspective. That like, okay, even if I'm not suffering now, that doesn't mean it's not coming for me right. at some point in my life, and I oh, should expect yeah. it. Right? It's mm -hmm. gonna come. Yeah. But also. I still have work to do then. If, mm -hmm. if, I'm, if I'm not wondering where my next meal is going to come from, that means I have extra that I can help those that are worrying yeah. about where their next meals are coming from. And then we wouldn't have to pay so much money to the gym, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just, you you know, don't have a gym? We, you yeah, get to go to a gym it's right like, now? It's like we're the only nation in the world, I think, that we could actually pay money to lose weight. <laughs> you know, we just got so much, right? You know, yeah, I, I need to do some more of that yeah. after COVID yeah. and well, sitting around you know, all the time. I'm waiting for heaven. They give you a new body. <laughs> Oh. It doesn't say that here, though. <laughs> yeah, it just you know. We, okay, that's my theology. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm hoping that's yeah. faith, right? So, this people that can withstand have not only gone through this tribulation, and there's a hope for there, but it's also because of Jesus Christ. Yeah, definitely. and that that really is the bottom line of this. That's what this whole thing is about: is that they are centered around the person and the work right. of Jesus Christ. And we see that this is a lamb that has sacrificed himself and, and these people have washed their clothes in the blood of the lamb, that, that that is what covers us, that is what washes us, that is what cleans us. So if that's our understanding of this passage, if that's this glimpse of heaven that we have to look forward to, how do we live now? What, what do we do with this here and now? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. A lot of times I think, you know, we, we look at this from um, a religious perspective, and that gives us an out in a sense because uh, it's religious to us because we're so far uh, away from the, the original language, and we, 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 it's that gap, right? The historical yeah. gap, right. the, the geographical gap, yeah. you know, the cultural gap. It, these were people trying to understand uh, what they were receiving from God. Um, but literally, what we see in this scripture, we, we get to peek into God's boardroom. Yeah. I mean, because literally this, it, this scripture is set, uh, there's 24 elders surrounding the throne. All right? Now, look at it. I don't know if any of you guys worked in corporate. I'm sure we're MVP, so <laughs> a lot of you guys worked in corporate. You know, so imagine this large table when you go into a meeting, right? Yeah. And you have 
at the head of the table, you have the CEO of the universe, which is God, <laughs> and then you have the staff. Now, these 24 elders, these were evidently human beings. Mm. They are human. They're elders, yeah. right? Because they come and they talk to John and say, hey, you right. know, I'm an elder just like you. So we're looking in, at the boardroom in heaven, and we're seeing how things are operating in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in, in heaven. heaven. Yep. Okay? So we're seeing how God operates in heaven. We see that God is working with human beings. The, the, the 24 elders had thrones, had crowns. They had seats yep. at the table. Uh, They're participating with God. Yeah. And God always created uh, humans, human beings to participate with them on ruling this world. Uh, and so if that's the case, if they're participating with him, and he's using people from diverse backgrounds, diverse languages, diverse tribes, in fact, that word in there when it talks about um, uh, different people, different tribes, it talks about ethnicity, where yeah. we get ethnics from. So yeah. It's, it's the ethna. The yeah. ethna, right? The, the diverse people. Then we who are representing him now, see, the thing about uh, those of us who have put our faith in Christ now we're actually his ambassadors here in a foreign land. This is, this is really a foreign land yeah. for us Christians, a yeah. land that we are one day, and if people really understood this, which I think they will, we're actually going to be the ones to take over the earth. Hmm. Okay? Uh, so now we're operating under the same, uh, you know, modus operandi of our corporate right. Leadership. We, we're supposed to be living the kingdom now. We have to live the kingdom now. So it's an upside-down kingdom. Instead of uh, you know trying to get things by force, we, we don't get things. We get we self-sacrifice. Yeah. All right. Instead of like you said, they would never hunger and they're never a thirst. Well, the biggest struggle people have today and why so many fights and wars is people think that there's somehow a lack of resources. Uh. Humanity has been fighting over resources since, you know, <laughs> day, so, one. You know day one, yeah. right? you know what I mean, and, or attention. And so God is saying there's no lack of resources. So we have to be the people to express that to the rest of humanity, live accordingly, okay, and show people uh, that are here on earth that no, the diversity is good, is, is how God intends. No, kindness is good, this is what God intends. No, uh, being self-sacrificing uh, is good, this is what God intends. And those who are not like that, and I'll give you a little tidbit, those who don't, do not have that mark, uh. okay, that mark, all right, of God, sealed with God's mark on yeah. your forehead, your thoughts, yeah. on your right hand, your actions, okay? Those are the individuals who reject God, yeah. okay? So we are to be people who represent God well now, and then in the consummation of all things, we will be the people God's administration on earth representing it here. Yeah. So how do we... Give me some examples, maybe from your own life or mm -hmm. things that you might suggest for us. What else does it look like in terms of how, how do we do the your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? What, what else does that look like? So the, the multicultural piece, mm -hmm. what, what does that look like for MVPC, a very moderately culturally diverse Place. Yeah. Although I was surprised that the languages that some of our folks spoke. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we, we're taught to kind of hide it. Like uh, my parents, uh, you know, my parents are from the South. Uh, I'm born in New York City, raised in the North. Um, they wanted us to speak in a way because they were uh. immigrants. You know, even though, you know, my ancestors go back, you know, 400 years or more mm. uh, in this country. But when they moved North, uh, they wanted us, we would always hear, you should speak uh, the English so clearly that when you answer the phone, no one can determine your ethnicity. Oh, interesting. You know what I mean? Uh, it was a survival technique. You know, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't want you speaking, like, out with our friends, we could speak what, what they would call, you know, slang and whatever. But they would want us to assimilate, okay? What God is saying is that I, I don't need you to assimilate, all right, um, to be like uh, something you're not. Yeah. I need you to change the way you think and change your actions to be who I created you to be. Yeah. So that means that, uh, for instance, 
we should not be ashamed I, 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 that we are born a certain way. Um, I don't want you to be, I'm not ashamed because I was born black. Um, I'm not ashamed because I, I was privileged to have a certain amount of education. Yeah. Uh, you should not be ashamed because you're Asian. You should not be ashamed because you're Anglo, you're white. You, but now what you do with that privilege, if you have privilege, what you do with that is, is, is that question at yeah. point. Now, if, you, if you're part of a group, a uh, particular segment of the population that now have power and authority and, and privilege, then what you do with that, that's what God is asking. So now we are called to use that privilege, use what God has given us to be a blessing to others. Yeah. That's the initial decree yeah. that for all humanity. Right. That's and, being human. And to try to be the kind of people that exhibit his kingdom as yeah. best we can. Right. And right. Like you were yeah. talking about the kindness, the love, yeah. all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, one person that I know has done that well uh, is a good friend of yours, works with your ministry, and is mm -hmm. a member here at our church, uh, is Lisa. Lisa, why don't you come up and yeah. share a little bit about uh, some of your journey working with Bay Community Fellowship and Prescott Elementary there. Thanks for joining us today and sharing a little bit of your story. My name is Lisa Shaw, and I'd like to start my testimony with a picture of myself and my precious little friend, Leba, taken in <laughs> Oakland several years ago. I got to know Leba and her family when they first moved here from Afghanistan. I have been meeting with her family regularly as a community volunteer, and we've developed a bond. For me, developing a rapport and learning from those that I serve is so rewarding. When you get past all the differences in income, race, age, language, you're left with what really matters, God's love, and it's real joy. For a long time, I was doing this in a vacuum, apart from a church organization. It wasn't until I joined MVPC that I got to experience the exponential benefit of co-working for Christ in a congregation. When our mission partner, Pastor Fleming, spoke at Mom's Council a couple years ago, he requested volunteers to serve at Prescott Elementary, the school across the, from his church in West Oakland. I got cleared to volunteer in the classroom for this under-resourced community. I met with the kids once a week in several classrooms and small groups. In this picture, the kids' faces are blurred, but we're having a snack and we're talking. Um, the kids are so sweet, and they really open up when you give them attention and encouragement. When COVID hit and we got sent home, I was able to continue to meet with some of the students on Zoom, but the challenges of distance learning in marginalized communities quickly became clear. Some of the students were housing insecure to begin with. Uh, many live in small spaces with multiple generations and lots of distractions, making it hard to learn online. A student I worked with joined our call from the bathtub the only quiet place she could find. It's heartbreaking. So in the fall, I put out a request at Mom's Council to purchase school supplies, headsets, and craft materials for the students in fourth and fifth grades. The support for these kids was overwhelming. Each student got new school supplies and craft materials to use at home. Here's a picture of the teacher and I with the donations. We also put out a request for more tutors to work with the students virtually. Now we have four volunteer tutors from MVPC that provide students with academic support and encouragement. Mom's Council also gave the fourth, fifth grade teacher an Amazon gift card for Christmas. She said to say thank you, and she ended up using it to buy each of her students a new computer mouse. Just beautiful. And because of the donations to Bay Community Fellowship during the mission market this past holiday, we were once again able to provide for the kids at Prescott Elementary. We prayerfully consulted with Marie, a staff member at Prescott, to see how we could best impact the students with the money raised. Marie saw that the kids needed a place to store their school supplies. Also on her wish list were dry erase materials. Our available funds weren't enough to provide a kit for all the kids, so we reached out to Pastor Fleming, who was willing and able to make up for the shortfall. Now each K through fifth grade student will receive a personalized storage bin and dry erase kit. I'm amazed but not surprised that at every point in this opportunity, you could see and feel God's hand at work. And as I was working on this testimony, I received this photo from Marie at Prescott. It's little Rosemary picking up her new school bin. So thank you for your help and let God be praised. Mm. 
Thanks, Lisa. That's exciting and encouraging. If other people want to get involved, how, how, how would they do that? Yeah, definitely. You can see Lisa. <laughs> Actually, it's been a blessing. She came in uh, and as a volunteer. You know, we, I love the Moms Club. Big shout out to the Moms Club. Um, as Lisa was one of our first volunteers, and we were at the school today actually um, giving out uh, the gift, and they are just so in love and so excited about what we're doing here, and uh, Lisa knows all of um, the requirements for getting involved in the school, going yeah. through the system, and they, they love us, they know about us, and they'll be happy to help. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you want to get in touch with Lisa, you can just shoot me an email and I'd be glad to pass that along to her. So uh, I'm dricketts at mvpctoday.org and I'd be glad to pass that along. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm Rev and Doc Fleming at Yahoo. Uh, so you can reach me there. Yeah. And uh, that's Rev and Doc. I'm not the Doc, my wife. <laughs> R E V N Doc? R E V N Doc, D O C, Fleming with two M's. Awesome. Well, Thank you for joining me today, oh, yeah. brother. It's, uh, we've been talking about doing something like this for a long time, and I'm really glad this worked out for us to do today as we talk about this vision of sort of this multicultural worship service. Have you ever experienced a worship service that's huge like that, that had thousands and thousands of people? Not yet, but when I get there, if you're not there, I'll t uh, well, I won't be able to tell you about it. <laughs> hopefully, I'll, hopefully, I'll see you there. We can experience it together, yeah, right? Yeah, we will. We <laughs> yeah. will. Well, so. we're going to sing this one final song here as the band begins to come back up. And it's one of, I think, most Christians' favorites. And one of the verses is, When we've been there for 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Let me pray for us. And then uh, we'll invite you to stand and sing Amazing Grace with us. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace. And we know, Jesus, it is only because of you that we can stand. It is only because of you and your sacrifice for us, your love for us, Jesus, your grace for us, that allows us to get through the tribulations that we have in life. And God, we look forward to that day when we will stand with all of your people, God, from every tribe and every tongue and every nation, Lord, before your throne and worship you. Lord, we worship you now in preparation for that time. In your name we pray, amen. Why don't you stand with us and sing this song. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Well, again, Curtis, thank you so much for joining me today. And church, thank you for joining us as well. I pray that you will go out from this place being reminded that you are part of this amazingly diverse kingdom of God and that you need to live here as a representative of it, seeing God's glimmer of his grace in all kinds of other people. Go in his grace, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.